Thank you, Margie, and yes. Uh, and thank you, Gold Country Writers, for having me. Thank you, everyone, for coming out on this gorgeous summer day. And thanks to Randy for Yay, helping me <laughs> set it up, because my Mac was not um, compatible with the uh, chords here. So I'm going to be talking to you about book cover design and formatting. And my next slide is a little about me. As Margie said, I have a degree in applied art and design from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And I started my career as a book cover designer when one of my friends who indie published her book way back when Create Space was a thing, uh, asked me to do her cover. And I thought, wow, that sounds like fun. And it just took off from there. And then I cold called Poison Pen Press, and they agreed to let me do some cover work. And it just kept growing uh, as indie, as the indie publishing industry grew, I was able to get more clients, and I've joined a lot of writing groups mm -hmm. and networked that way, and so it's just been a joy. And I, I really love working with authors because we become a team, uh, they become my friends, and it's just wonderful to see their dream come to fruition. And they're excited about the cover, and I'm excited about it, and it just is a wonderful way to make a living. <laughs> um, so why hire a cover artist? A lot of people try to do their own covers, that's fine, but if it looks unprofessional, then people will tend to not want to pick up the book or, or click on it on, on a, you know internet site to purchase. And one of my cover uh, clients, or yes, client says, I won't bother with a book if the cover is not professionally done. And I'm sure you can agree with that. You know, the, the story may be wonderful. It may be a best-selling novel, but if the cover looks amateurish, then people will think the writing is amateurish. Oh, before I continue, I, I do have business cards in the back if you want to pick one up. Uh, so, what's important to discuss between designer and author? First is the cost, of course, and to be completely transparent, I charge $300. That includes the cover for your ebook and your print book, which is, of course, the front, spine, and back. Um, that is very, that's an average price. There are people who charge less, but it's hard to find them, uh, and they don't do a very good job, quite frankly. Um, and then there's mostly people who charge more. But you can go to the web website of the various designers and, of course, do your research. And it's important to find book cover designers word of mouth or if you're part of a, a writing group. Um, they have listservs. You can go on those listservs and, and ask the question and you'll get lots of uh, referrals. Uh, the next thing to talk to your designer about is artificial intelligence. Uh, do they use AI when they're coming up with cover solutions? And if you're opposed to that, you just want to make it clear. The genre, uh, you definitely want to talk to your designer about your genre because I worked with a client who did a traditional mystery and I gave her traditional mystery covers. She used those covers and then she went to a different design service and had them change the look to more of a cozy feel. So you want to be clear about the audience and who you're trying to attract. Uh, the contract, it's important to whether you sign a contract or not, it's important to have some kind of agreement, whether it's in an email or it's in an actual contract form, as to how many concepts you're going to get. I provide up to three. Uh, how many revisions are allowed? I allow up to three. After that, it's $25 per change. Uh, some people are unlimited revisions, but I've had a some clients who just, oh my gosh, you know, they just want to see this little change, that little change, and it, and it really um, can be above and beyond what's expected. Mm -hmm. So just make sure that's all clear. 
Um, also talk to them about what format you want. If you want only ebook, that should be a certain price. Like I charge two fifty if that's all you want is an ebook cover. Um, if you want large print format, if you want um, hardcover, all these different formats of a print book take time to create. They use different cover templates, and so you want to just have all that discussed with your designer. So what makes a good cover? Type that is readable at thumbnail size, because of course when you're looking online, the pictures of covers are very small. You want it to be eye-catching, not too busy. You don't want to tell your whole story on the cover, believe me. You want the mood and tone conveyed, and make sure that the genre is clear. So rather than showing every character in your story on the front cover and the weapon that was used to kill someone if it's a murder mystery, um, you want really more to think about the mood and tone and make sure it fits in with the genre. Which takes us to genre matching. So genre matching is where you look at all the covers in your genre that's, that, you, that appeal to you or that are best-selling uh, books. So say your mystery genre, you want to see, um, maybe you're a cozy mystery writer, you want to see what the pop, most popular cozy mysteries are out there, and you want to make sure that your cover fits into that genre, but stands out. So it's a, that's the challenge for your book cover designer. So do your homework, look for trends so you're more aware of what's going on in the industry and know your audience. Maybe you're a cozy uh, mystery writer who mostly appeals to older readers. Maybe you're a YA mystery writer. So you definitely want to understand your audience. So here's examples of genre matching. I know they're small. Um, so in the thriller category at the top, you can see that the name of the author is really big and there's usually one person silhouetted against a dramatic, colorful background and they're usually running. <laughs> um, I don't know why, but that's a thing. And <laughs> so, so just so you're aware, that is a typical thriller Every reader that looks at those will say, okay, that's a thriller, that's what I want. Um, they'll recognize that. Then the mystery suspense, the next row, the title is huge and it, it just occupies the entire space. And then the, the author name is smaller, although of course with Agatha Christie, her name is the biggest because, well, she's Agatha Christie. So she can do whatever she wants. She doesn't have to really fit in. It's just her name that needs to stand out. The um, mystery suspense category has some alluring, intriguing, large image in the background. And that, that look signifies mystery suspense. Urban fantasy on the last row, you have these ornate typefaces with this sort of a moody sci-fi magical background usually with you know the, the main character or or the romantic um, couple and that has its own look altogether. So trends, this is a big trend, I'm sure you've all noticed it. Uh, Richard Osman, best-selling novel of the Thursday Murder Club was the trendsetter, I mean, he personally wasn't, his designer was, um, and look at all these other covers that have a similar look and feel. Now these people are, are making sales off the fact that their cover looks a lot like the Thursday Murder Club, and good for them. But after a while, this trend is going to be watered down to the point where you're not gonna stand out anymore. So, now we're going to talk a little bit about AI. 
On the very basic level, uh, a designer uses Photoshop and they have a, a new feature now called generative fill. And that is a time saver where you just highlight the uh, section of the image that you want to have the AI generate and then it uses pixels from the existing image to create this new part of your image. And most of the time, it's, it's exactly what you want. Sometimes you have to ha ask it to generate more often to see if it'll finally give you what you want. But it is a huge time saver because I used to have to copy and paste sections and then you know, use that to fill in these blank areas. For example, if I wanted to use something from the front cover on the back cover, then I would have to recreate that, and it was just, just took forever. On a more complex level, this cover that I designed, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of crazy. Uh, she wanted a crocodile with a pumpkin, a jack-o'-lantern in its mouth on the beach, and, wow. you know, kind of crazy. That would have taken me forever to find a crocodile and then, you know, edit it to where its mouth is open and it's holding this jack-o'-lantern in its mouth. I asked AI in one of my photo uh, websites that I use, it's called 123rf.com, but there are a lot of different um, image stock sites out there that have uh, AI generators. And I, I gave it a prompt that described this crocodile with a jack-o'-lantern in its mouth, and I got on the beach, and I got some really strange, um, you know, solutions, but I was able to use, like the woman running is one, the beach scene is another, the crocodile is another, and the jack-o'-lantern is another, and the witch hat is another. So even though it didn't come up with everything I wanted, that's fine because I was able to generate other images that I could then piece together. So, so the jack-o'-lantern, um, I had to put inside of his mouth. But his, he was already holding something. It just wasn't exactly what I wanted. And then I had to make the bottom part of his mouth open up more so that the jack-o'-lantern would fit. Again, this is totally up to you, but you do want to make it clear if you're okay using AI for your covers. These are other examples of what AI will do, which I find kind of humorous. So I, I for my second book, A Deadly Match, I am having a really hard time coming up with a cover. The first book, it was easy. Um, the victim dies in a vintage trailer, so I put a vintage trailer on my uh, cover and, of course, used the police tape around it, which signifies a mystery, although it's cliche. Um, and this one has a, my second book has a cat in it, but, um, and I know that's appealing to readers, so I'm trying to fit a cat into a boxing mystery. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why, you know, I asked in the prompt to have a cat inside of a boxing ring, but it's really pretty silly. And, and then there's, uh, yeah, it's cute. Um, and then there is a golden chalice that's important in the story, and I asked it to generate a golden chalice with a black cat sitting next to it. And it, you know, has this little tiny kitten at the base of the chalice, which is pretty silly. So these are some covers that I did for Cozy. My book, A Deadly Combo, is a traditional cozy blend. And I, again, used um, the vintage Airstream trailer. I put a dog on the cover. There is a dog in the story. Again, that appeals to readers. And I tried to uh, use fonts that suggest cozy, and then the overall look is mystery, traditional. The next um, cover is Hannah Dennison, and that's a, a completely unique illustration style. None of these on here were AI generated, just to make that clear. 
uh, What Child Is This? That is a composition of, of several um, photographic images. Birthdays Are Murder, I think a lot of you know Cindy Sample. Um, I've done all her covers. They're a lot of fun. This one is her new series with an older protagonist and takes place up in the Washington, um, Seattle area, excuse me. And that one uses, gosh, I can't even count, like the birthday cake is one image, the presents are another, the table is another, so that's three, the spilled glass, four, the chair knocked over, five, the grass, six, <coughs> the dead man, if you can see his toe. Yeah, shoe and pants, that's another, that's seven. Um, the flowers and, and trees, that, those are two different images. Oh, and there's a butterfly, so that's like nine. And then we have a flying seagull, that's ten. The lighthouse, eleven. And yeah, I, I had to, you know, put all this together. Uh, framed and frosted, Kim Davis has a golden doodle, and she wants that dog on every cover. <coughs> So she uh, sent me photos, and, and we always dress him up. <laughs> uh, these are other genres. I'm not showing any memoir covers or science fiction covers, but I've done every genre. So whatever um, you might write in, um, please see me. And oh, we have a question in the back. No, no, I meant I do. Oh, I'm not, I, I'm sorry. Can, I'm just not showing examples of memoir. Can you tell us an example for memoirs? We have two memoir groups. Oh, so, um, I mean, tell tell you an example? You mean describe what yeah. I've done? Yes. Yeah. What style, I mean, if you have any thoughts on a memoir or autobiography cover, because it's going to be much different than those are. Yes, okay, so good questions, thank you. Um, so the memoir normally has to do, it's, it, it's very personal to the writer, and if you, one of the ones I did recently was, uh, it involved um, photographs um, that were personal to the author uh, about their experience, whether they were vintage photographs from their own collection or from an experience they had. <clears throat> And then usually um, there's kind of a, either a moody scene in the background, it could be spiritual, it could be a landscape that, that represents uh, where they grew up or, or some part of their life that they're writing about. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it really depends. It, it's personal to the author, but yet again, you want to make sure the reader knows it's a memoir when they see the cover children's books, excuse me, <coughs> here, Hi. children's books, but I've seen so many YouTube videos on for little children that I'm thinking more third, fourth, fifth graders <coughs> at that age. That actually is a genre that I don't do because it is highly dependent on the illustrator that you hire to illustrate the entire book. Mm. Okay. Yeah, and they should know. Okay. Yeah. I hope that um, answers that question because that, that's yeah very specific to the to that illustrator. Yes. Could you talk about getting permission or copyright? So the um, stock image sites that I use, I pay them to license to get the license to use the images that I download. And, and that, some of them are very restrictive in terms of you can only use it for up to, say, 10,000 books that you sell, which is like Getty. Getty is a very expensive stock photo site, and they have very limited usage. So you really have to, if you want an image from Getty, you really want to have to you know, do your research, and you really, it has to be an image that you can't find anywhere else, and so it's very important to you to pay the extra money and to then understand the limitations for that image. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, most stock photo sites like Dreamstime, 123RF.com, uh, iStock Photo, um, 
there's so many others. They have an unlimited license usage and you pay either per image or you can pay a subscription to use however many downloads. Yes? Well, when I purchased a, um, an image, I got a written that that was now my image. And I could do anything I wanted with it. And so, that's, so I took it to someone like you and put it up there that they could also manipulate it. But I have it in writing and signed <coughs> Okay, um, yeah, so it, it depends on, um, you know, where you got that image, who you're getting it from. The, when I download an image from a stock photo site, it's all part of the agreement that I have to click, yes, I understand, you know, I read and understood this agreement. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Yes? Why would one not want to use AI? Um, some people are opposed because they feel that um, artists' work have been oh, used to educate the AI mm -hmm. and... They're not getting credit. Right. Some are not getting paid. Some are. It's, it's a very um, gray area, if you will. Um, my take on it is when I set up a prompt for AI, I don't use any famous artist names or photographer names. You know, I don't even, I don't say in the style of Andrew Wyeth or something, you know. Um, I just say generate a photorealistic image of a black kitten next to a golden chalice. And my opinion on that is the AI is using, it has learned how to create a golden chalice, how to create a black kitten, and then it creates a, an image and you can download it just like you would any other image that's available on the stock photo site. So as long as you're being responsible and you're not using a famous person's name or, and you'll get um, a warning if you try to do something like that, you will, you should get a warning. Um, otherwise, it's not a very, um, I would question that AI generator if it's not giving you a warning. Mm -hmm. Yes, Frank. I'm noticing on the slides that are on the screen right now <clears throat> that there's a very distinct difference between the covers that have plain lettering and the covers that have fancy lettering. Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, okay, so, John Lansing's cover, 25 to Life, he already had a uh, look and feel set up from a previous designer. So I'm using uh, that look and feel, and his name needed to be big because he is a known author in this thriller genre. The Madame and Lace, that's Jenny Grossenbacher, I know a lot of you know her. Um, that is part of the look of her um, American Women uh, series, and it's, it's got a lot of feminine qualities, if you will, using the, the ornate M and L in the title. And that is a look and feel that she created as a brand. And it appeals to women and I'm sure some men read her books, but it's more appealing to women and suggestive of a bit of romance and history. Uh, Bone Reapers is a traditional mystery, and this font is easy to read, and it is, it is typical of a traditional mystery that is just a sans serif font that's easy, easy to read. Um, Crimson Rain is a more of a YA, um, kind of a fantasy, yeah, fantasy book. And fantasy books always use these um, ornate fonts. Um, Paradise is Deadly is a traditional mystery anthology.
Yes. Why do you suppose they use pink color? That is, so that was my decision, just to um, mirror the pink flamingo. And even though Paradise isn't really that easy to read at thumbnail size, Deadly is, and all the other elements on it suggest mystery. Any other questions about these covers? Yes. Did you say that book was an anthology? Yes. So meaning all different authors? Yes, and they're all mystery stories. Okay. Definitely, definitely. Uh, this anthology is from one of the Florida Sisters in Crime um, writing chapters, and so you're going to have humorous mystery. Um, maybe even maybe they accepted some YA mystery. I don't know, but it's definitely a cover that that has to appeal to readers of different types of mystery. Where John Lansing, for sure, he writes dark. His thrill, yeah. So, you know, if you're the type of person who reads that kind of book, um, you you will gravitate to to that kind of dark cover. So these are a series that I've done, and I just want to talk a little bit about the importance of establishing a brand and a look and feel for your series, and sometimes a logo. So for the um, top left series, we have a um, you know, swooping sort of a um, border and the protagonist is always uh, larger and in the front. There's an element from the mystery that's a clue that's, that's in the foreground and uh, so it all obviously has the same fonts and has a similar look and feel. The next one over, the Taffy Cannon series, I created a logo for her series called Mystery, Mysterious Travels, and it has a little uh, compass icon in the banner at the top, and then every cover has one image, one big image, with her name fairly large, and again, same fonts. Then down in the lower left is a different travel mystery series and uh, we created, or I created, a logo that has, it looks like a passport stamp, and there's an airplane in it, and uh, the banner at the top. And these also use just one large image with similar fonts. And then the lower right, uh, again, you can see there's a similar look and feel across that series. So think about, um, if you are writing a series, you want to always think about your next, well, if, if, you, if you're writing a series, you should already have a brand or um, a logo. If you're not, you want to make sure and get that, maybe have those covers redone. And of course, that's the beauty of indie publishing. You can change your covers to try to generate more sales or to nail that uh, category that maybe you missed with your first cover. Um, and talk to your designer about creating a logo for the series because that could cost extra. Would you, would you point out, you said you made the logos for two of them, would you point out? Yeah, I know that it's kind of hard to see. This has a compass and then the title of the uh -huh. series and then this has a, the passport. Got it, thank yeah. you very much. Okay, so as far as print books, think of it as packaging for your product. Your story is a product and the cover is packaging. You want to use every single area, if possible, for anything that is going to help sell your book. So the size is very important. A lot of people use six by nine, but I prefer five and a half by eight and a half. That's what my book is. I feel it's easier to hold in the hand and if you're not sure, um, if you are just starting out and you're first publishing, 
Make sure and hold different size books and decide what you feel is best. The front cover, uh, think about having a tagline on there. Um, just to t convey to the reader a little bit more about your story. A tagline could be, yes? Is that the same as the subtitle? If you have a subtitle, you probably don't need a tagline. Um, a tagline is um, more like a, sort of an advertising slogan, if you will. Can't like yes. Okay, because all my books have subtitles that explain more about the book. Okay, then that, that's fine. If, if you didn't have a subtitle, you might want to think about a tagline. Mm -hmm. And I'm blanking on one, but say it's the haunted house, and then your tagline could be no one survives, or only one survives, or you know what I mean, something like that. Um, you might want to have an um, excerpt of someone's review on the front cover, and I did that on my cover. Um, I used part of a review from Cindy Sample on the front cover. The spine, for those of you who don't know, your choice of interior paper, which is white or cream, plus your final page count determines the width of the spine. And that's important because your designer can't create the right cover without knowing exactly how wide your spine is. Um, cream paper is a little thicker than white, so that's why there's a difference between white and cream. The back cover, um, I always suggest that right above your brief synopsis, you have a teaser to grab the reader. Again, it's kind of like a tagline. So if you have a subtitle on the front, you might want to use a tagline on the back. And then an author bio if you don't put it inside, and the author website and an imprint. Some of you have you know, a publishing uh, name uh, that you use and a, and a logo. Uh, reviews, of course. If you don't have reviews, get one good quote from a reader or reviewer, preferably in your genre. Um, or an expert if you're writing a nonfiction book. Um, if you have time, and I always suggest this, please order a proof copy before you hit that publish button. So you get the proof copy and it has a gray stripe around the front and back cover to prevent, it says not for resale, um, but still you want to go through and look at that book and, and do one final check to see if there's anything that needs to be fixed. You can give those proof copies um, to people who will read it and then give you a review and then your designer can put those reviews on the back cover and then you can hit the publish button. Mm -hmm. um, other books, if you have other books then you will want to advertise that on the back cover if you have space. So for example, the one on the left, she advertises her next book in the series on the back cover. Mm -hmm. And, um, and of course, Anne DeVigo, she's showing the, the option to put her author photo and a brief bio and contact information with one strong review. So that all works fine. Yes? What I have noticed in the books that are coming out lately is that the whole back cover is a filled up with reviews. They're all reviews. And then you don't really even know anything about the <laughs> right. Um, so, and that, thanks for bringing that up because um, hardcover, if you want to do a hardcover, you have a choice between just case laminate or a flap, a dust jacket. Mm -hmm. Not a flap, but a dust jacket which has the two flaps. Mm -hmm. um, that just allows you more real estate for more reviews and the synopsis and everything else you want to throw in there, and yes, a lot of people use a ton of reviews. I think it's a little overkill. You can put, a, I think you should just have a few reviews on the back that are very strong from uh, either well-known people or well-known sources, and then put the rest of your reviews on the inside if you want to use those reviews. Yes? So what you're saying basically is there's a different style of doing the covers for a hard copy and a well, only in that, so case laminate means you don't have a dust jacket with hat, which is the two flaps, the paper wrap. Um, but it's like a print cover in terms of you, you only have 
the front, the spine, the back to use. Um, it's, I mean, it's like a paperback cover. Does that answer your question? Yes, okay. So as far as formatting, the key elements to, to remember, um, make sure it looks professional. And professional means that it's easy to read. You're using a serif typeface that is not too small. There's a lot of white space so the eye doesn't get fatigued when it looks on the page and it sees small type packed in, not enough margins. You want leading that is not too tight. That's the space between the sentences or the lines, excuse me. Uh, generous margins on all four sides of the page. And then the author bio can go at the back with contact information and a request for honest reviews. And an excerpt from the next book or other books if your book is not a series book. So, that's it. Any yeah. more questions? We have two questions. You? Hi. Um, could you read the book before you design? Oh, that's a good question. I, if I have time, I will. Um, I find that does create a better cover. So yes, if there's time, whether I, if I have time and if the client has time, because the client might want to publish in a month, but I need two months to read the story because of my schedule. It, you know, so it just depends. Um, the other question was back here. Do you recommend a particular font size? Um, a, a particular font for the, for the inside. inside. So I, in, in this book of mine, I used Iowan. And it's, it's just a more friendly serif font, but you can look at it and, and see what I mean. Um, Iowan is good. Uh, Garamond is OK. It's um, very classic Garamond. Um, Gaudi, sometimes Baskerville. About the size, I've seen some printed books. They're so small, and I don't know. Personally, I would like a little one. I mean, a bigger one. Right. Right. In fact, my book is, um, I think, 11 and a half font, which is actually fairly large, but it's not large print. Um, I I think it's it, it's very readable. So you can um, again, like when I asked you to hold the books and see what size you like look at the different font sizes and tell your designer, I want this size. It, because you may not know exactly what size it is, they can tell. Um, yes? I'm going to go back to the copyright on the AI. Suppose you create an image like you did yeah. with a cat and a chalice or, or a person dressed a certain way. Um, how, so um, you, AI creates that and it's on your book. What if somebody, let's say five years later, Um, so that can happen even when you're downloading an image that isn't AI generated. Somebody else can still use that image. You're only getting the license to use it for your needs, but it does. It's not an exclusive license. So I do. I, I much would rather create a cover that is very unique, using like that one image for Sandy Sample. You know, 12 different pictures combined because very unlikely anybody's going to come up with something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of cozy covers look, have that same look and feel, but it's not going to be that exact image. Mm -hmm. um, but the, so there's an option in the AI generator that you can choose to put on private. <coughs> so any AI uh, images you generate will not be available to other people. And you can also set it up to where they disappear after they're created. So there's ways that you can control that. Yes? I know marketing uh, to your audience is wrapped up a lot into your covers. Um, your marketing to younger people, older people, or whatever it is. Action enthusiasts or whatever. I tend to be drawn to a book that has a simpler cover if I'm just looking at covers. And when it's matte finish, as mm -hmm. opposed to glossy, I just mm -hmm. want to know. I know it's subjective, but what your thoughts were? Um, 
Um, so I always, if people aren't sure what finish to have on their cover, I always recommend matte for fiction, and glossy is the normal option for nonfiction. Uh, but it's personal, uh, just like the size of the book. If you really like glossy and you're writing a fiction novel, then you know that's your choice. Um, and the other, oh, you like the just the larger the image yeah. simplicity, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> and and talk to your designer about if you're a writer and you're looking for a book cover designer, you want to convey that because that is also a personal, um, you know, opinion choice that you can help that can influence what the designer does. You recommend a good site like Fiverr or some other site that might sites that might be good for a Shopping. to find a designer. Yeah. Um, I like yourself. <laughs> I, I can help you, uh, I can give you some other referrals. Um, depends on your genre, some people do specialize in certain genres. Um, Reedz, I would, I would much prefer you go to Reedz, Reedz.com, R-E-E-D-S-Y, versus Fiverr. Fiverr is dangerous. Um, and I'm only meaning that in terms of you can lose money because um, I personally have trying to find a website person, and you will eventually find somebody, but you might lose a lot of money trying to find that person. It, it, it's just the way it is. Everybody I know who's ever used Fiverr has gone through that experience. So I'm, I'm not saying it's a terrible thing, option, but there are a better options. Yes? Uh, two things. So uh, about reusing images on one of my books, there's a cabin in the woods. I've seen that same cabin on about five other books now. Oh. <laughs> uh, probably no one else would notice it, but it's like, you know, when you get a new car, you start to see all uh, yeah. 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 Uh, And then second, so if we were to use your service and then come back at a later date and say, I want an audio book cover, Thank you for that question. So uh, audio covers are an extra cost, um, so make sure you understand that with your designer. Um, I, I charge $50 to do an audio cover, but because of, again, generative fill, if, if I can do it like that, um, then it would be like 25. It just depends on if the author wants uh, me to recreate, because, you know, <coughs> recreate the profile book cover into a perfect square can be very simple or it can mean moving some objects around. So if, if the author needs objects moved around to fit the perfect square format, then I would charge 50. Mm -hmm. I think your prices are very reasonable. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you for the everyday person. Yeah, I haven't raised my prices in a million years, so. <laughs> yes. I used Fiverr and I had a super excellent experience. Oh, good for you. I'm and very happy to hear it that. It was wonderful. Good. And the second thing is, is you said that you only allow so many changes to your cover. Um, when I was working with my cover designer, she got the cover beautiful, everything was great, but she couldn't get the arm of the little violin player correct. And she'd show me one way, and she'd show me another, and she'd show, and she couldn't get it. She finally went and looked at a violin player <laughs> online, and she got the arm correct. But we went through probably just four or five changes just with that arm. Do you consider that a change, or is that just a, um, is that just a tiny thing? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I would not charge for those additional changes because you want to get it right um, that that's different from can you I want to see the title in purple or mm -hmm. I want to use this different font or let's change the boat from a sailboat to a yacht you know that's different but because she couldn't get the arm right um, I think that that's perfectly within the original cost of the cover mm -hmm. any other questions oh <coughs> yes I'm curious about the tension between what the author wants and the publisher wants. So when you submit your cover preference, your design, he's also going to take a risk in selling your book. What, what kind of tension is there between 
Um, okay, so usually traditional publishers don't allow you, as the author, any say in the cover unless that's part of your contract. Um, and that, you know, they usually know what they're doing, but I've had like a very popular author is Terry Shames, and she said her next book takes place in the, in, in the Sierra Nevada mountains, but they showed a cover that had a desert scene. And she was like, well, that's, that doesn't suggest where this story has been, takes place. And they said, well, we don't care. We really like it. Yeah. And was she stuck? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure she could fight it, but um, she just chose not to. Yes. Oh, well, Marty, there's somebody behind you. Oh, okay, you. go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Thinking of your image of the small cat who was a big chalice, if you had taken two images, if you owned the chalice, you owned the cat, you own each of those images and the image rights from your photos, can you use AI to combine those and get away with a combination that's without licensing fees? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know how to do that. I mean, I've never tried. Um, I don't know that you can upload, you would have to upload, you would have to upload those two photos and, and I, I don't think they have that option right now. But in um, Photoshop, you could probably take the chalice and then isolate or highlight an area on it and say, put a black cat here and it will do that and see if that works. Um, and I didn't mention, but there's a couple of other programs that are super high-end AI generated. Uh, Mid Journey is one and Dolly is another. So um, those are very, again, high-end. You, ha you have to have a learning curve to learn how to use it, which I haven't done yet. Um, but those generate very, very specific images, and I'm sure there are a lot, of mo lot more bells and whistles and features using that program that I'm not aware of. Um, wait, Margie had a question? Yes. I was, I was just wondering in terms of a book's genre, because I always get, uh, go to face in a book and pick up their Indie Next pamphlets. So a lot of books have like a novel or memoir, you know, the identifying genre on the book cover. So do you recommend that and, or would someone put it on the back or? Um, so you mean just using the words a novel? Yeah, I noticed for your book, for instance, you have a Rocky Nelson uh, boxing mystery. So you don't have just a mystery. I mean, you identify the series. Right. So how critical is it for a book to have some identifying information about the genre? Oh. Um, I, a lot of people do use the word a novel, so that tells everyone it's fiction. But in terms of um, making sure the reader knows what genre it is, um, there, you know, like you said, there's different ways in terms of the branding of a series. Um, but when you, when you sell your book online, it's going to be placed in a certain category that you determine when you upload your book. Um, and likewise, in a bookstore, they're going to put it um, typically in, in that category of mystery or whatever. Um, I, I think it might be a little, unless you're doing a series, I guess it could, it's really going to have to, the, the, the cover design um, does the heavy lifting and I don't know that you need to, um, you know, hit the person over the head by saying this is a thriller. Or, but a lot of people do, so I'm sorry, it's, it's kind of an individual situation. And then I have a question on the interior, the book formatting. Do you work on that also, or? I do. That's um, I charge one hundred and fifty dollars to do book formatting, and that includes the ebook formatting. So it's print and ebook. Um, yeah. So okay, and then so normally, do you recommend? You know, a lot of books have the author's name on top of the page and the book title or variations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what would you recommend? Um. 
I typically like the page number on the bottom with the uh, title, I think, on the left side and the author name on the right. I forget now which, which it is. Um, that's what I typically do, but if, if an author wants, you know, the page number up at the top with the name of the author or the name of the book, that's, I'll do that. Yes. What are the types of things that belong in book formatting? Are we talking about a table of contents? Right. So the, there's, the book is um, separated into three sections. It's called the front matter, which has your copyright page, your title. So it would go in order of title page, copyright page, um, other books in this, you know, that the author has written. Um, sometimes the title page is repeated after that, and then your main content, which begins the story. And then there's back matter, which contains, um, like the author bio, and excerpts of another book, or uh, acknowledgments. Oh, in the front matter, you would have your dedication. Uh, and, and if it's nonfiction, the front matter would have table of contents. Yes. I, I cover design with Mrs. Midjourney. Oh, great. Which is really a very powerful program. Yes. And it's, and it's advancing very quickly. It does more and more. And what he does is he puts a prompt in through Chat GPT, and then Chat communicates to Midjourney. Yes. So he never communicates directly to Midjourney at all. Hmm. Well, it's uh, it's you know. Yeah. Seamlessly integrated. And but mid journey is not that expensive. It costs like ten bucks a month, up to thirty bucks a month, and right. you only have to pay for the month you're using. So. Yeah, yeah. It's um, yes. It, it's it's all about the prompt when you're using AI. It's how you describe what you want. And oh my gosh, I've read some prompts that are so descriptive. I never would have even thought of it. You know, there's lingo that you can use that maybe a um, photographer would know, but I wouldn't know. Um, so yes, it's part, part of the learning curve is understanding how to write that descriptive prompt to get what you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Frank. Um, I would ask you if you can to clarify an impression that I have about AI. My sense is that hear so much about the large language models that are used to train the AI. My impression is, let's talk about the gold chalice with the kit. Um, theoretically, the AI program has looked at 10,000 golden chalices mm -hmm. of all kinds, from all periods. And what you get you say give me a golden chalice is you might get the lighting from one image, the design from another image, the shape of the cup from another image. In other words, it's like instead of one new one, you get a pot and all those new ones make up the image that you get. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, uh, to say that you're stealing an artist's work I think is misleading because, again, what you have in the image that you've got might have 5% of what this artist did in one painting. Is that a good impression or not? That is very close to how I look at it. Um, I think AI, as scary as it is, um, has learned how to create a chalice by creating a million, thousand, trillion chalices. and. At this point, it probably doesn't even reference, you know, it doesn't, it isn't like a little kid anymore with a crayon drawing, it's, it knows, okay, a chalice looks like this, and, and, and based on the prompt, if you're asking for like a jewel encrusted chalice, if you're asking for a, a chalice from a specific era in, in, in the times in history, um, it will, it will create that. It, if, it's, if it's that specific, it will have to understand from history what those chalices look like. But, but yes, I agree with you in general. Thank you.
Yes, I have a couple suggestions for your covers that hit me if you're interested. Sure. <laughs> they may not fit because I don't know what your book's about, but just working with the information you have there. Because um, everything was just so straight, sitting up and like it, it wasn't alive to me. That's oh, what okay. I didn't like Did. about it. Um, so um, the, the cat in the middle of the ring, what if there was a, a big boxing glove and the cat's either peeking out or playing, looping in? Because that's oh. what the cat does. They're curious now. That may not fit the character of the cat. That's funny because I, I did um, one of my favorite versions of a cover idea for my second book is a cat looking at a boxing glove. And um, I, I, it was it reminded me of the uh, Victrola. Um, yeah. You know, with the spotty dog, dog or whatever. Yeah. yeah, and I thought, oh, this is good. But I showed it to Cindy Sample, and she's like, well, the the, the glove just looks like it's laying there, and, and it's not very colorful. And so I was like, oh, you know, back to the drawing board. But that's still funny. It could be in the ring, but it could be on the ground. Yeah. And the cat's either pawing at yeah. it, or if it's a kitten, it could be coming out. Like, yeah, yeah so more of an action. Yeah. And so the cat's the same thing there. with the chalice. If it's a kitten and it's standing up, maybe the kitten could be coming out, or if it's laying down, or the or or the kitten could be on its back and the playing with the child, pushing the child yeah. on its feet. Or no, I like something. that. I like that. I I, I will uh, I will try and uh, yeah, get AI to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, you are next, and then you me. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> When I go in and look at covers now, and I'm very into um, middle grade and into teenage types of books, when I go in and look at those books, I hit with all these covers that look exactly alike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all the same fantasy stuff mm -hmm. and with everything else, and none of it looks alike. It yeah. all, it, it's so much that I just don't even want to look at any of it. So what's the most, most important thing about creating a, a cover that is unusual and people will look at it? And the distinctive part. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's a million dollars at color versus font. Is right. Yeah. 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 Which one is it? No, that's a, that's a good question. It, that's the challenge for every designer, and it's it's a matter of finding that sweet spot where you have the right font, you you find the right color, you have the right image or images, and it just all becomes almost magical. And and the author and the designer are like, wow, you know, that's usually the best compliment is wow, mm -hmm. and uh, I love it. Um, so I can't answer that. It's just that's part of the journey. Yeah, and that's part of the magic. Yeah, yes. and that's the thing that conflicts me with AI. Like, there's that magic yeah. that happens between my designers and me. Yeah. Like, we're like, and yes. this, well, what about this? Oh, just put it right there. Stop, yeah. stop, stop. You know, because yeah. they'll be moving around the page. We're doing it on Zoom. And I'll be like, stop, stop, stop. Yeah. So, like, AI gets to do the magic. Like, yeah. but like they, it but depends on how, how involved you want to be. If it's a push button book, yeah. Push the button, get a, get a cover, but there's that magic that you put into your book yeah. that you don't get to put into your cover if you don't work with the designer. Right, right. And AI's not going to get it just right. It's missing that extra yeah. human touch. Yes? Okay, um, you mentioned the people I used to use to do all of this formatting and everything are not doing it so much anymore. But would you take a Right. A lot of times in the past, and you have to go through a lot of the groups. But I'm get a different, of course, a new ISBN number for the hard path, and then do you uh, just be able to format it so that they can the it? Yes. Um, so whoever would do that formatting would need the manuscript file, you know, the original right. Word file, and yeah, yeah. And you can take that Word file and then fit it into the hard path. Right, I use um, a program called InDesign. Okay. It's part of the yeah. Adobe Creative Suite. So I would take the Word file and put it into, I would format using InDesign. And then, I, and then you use a template. So every, 
every um, type of cover you want uses a template, whether you're using Amazon's KDP or Ingram Sparks or whoever, even Lulu, they have their own templates. Yes. How, how tight are you with your source files? <laughs> because of what she's saying, like if I had my source files, then 10 years from now, if I wanted to do something, I could have it done, even if we were not in touch anymore. But if, if, the, if the artist wants to keep their source files. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to provide those files. Excellent. I just need them to ask me. I'm not going to provide them unless I'm asked. And okay. it doesn't cost anything. But, um, but yes, I, I keep everything in an archive, and, and not very many people ask me for those files, but, but I think it would, it would be smart for each author to have those files. Thank you. Yes? With all this talk about AI and so forth, I just want to make my comment about that. It's not that it is evil or whatever, <laughs> necessarily. But the magic for me as a reader or a potential reader, when I see the cover, that comes from the artist, which is you. You hearing and connecting with the author. And that's why I think it's so important to have the right cover designer. Because people can download all kinds of stuff. But it takes the artist's eye to be able to see where it goes best and to and to see the light in the eye of the author who says, yeah, that's perfect. So I just want to affirm that, yeah, there are all these different elements, but they come together through a human's own insights and experiences. And, and that's the crucial piece of all of this stuff. Thanks for what you do. Yeah. Oh. Thanks. Yes. I see this really weird parallel, and, and I'm sorry if I seem sort of out of the ball game right now, but you know how every time a development comes in and they start putting in a new little strip mall in your area, and they're calling that gentrification? Mm -hmm. I never even knew what that was until I started seeing it absolutely everywhere. And then you go to another part of the country, and golly, I thought this was my neighborhood. I had no idea where I was. And we're losing our, our flavor, you know? Yes. We're losing, yeah. and it's happening across the world, too. And AI in literature and in graphics feels to me like the gentrification mm -hmm. of literature, because yeah. it's like they're building this huge pool of schlock. Yeah. And it's standard <laughs> because it's an amalgamation of all right. those images into the, yeah. oh, the perfect kitty cat. Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. bullshit. No, I, <laughs> I, I think if you really uh, notice, you can tell an AI-generated image. Mm -hmm. It has a softness to it. There's a, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's completely personal, and mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying. I just wanted to talk about it because it is an important part of book cover design, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? No? Thank you so much. Thank you.